Today I will not talk about double beta decay, but about uh, this part of my research that deals with uh, direct detection of dark matter. And first I will give some introduction before I will talk about, um, well, you know, the status of the field, what are the current experiments, and where would we like to go in the future. So just briefly, really very brief history to dark matter. Already 1922, uh, Captain, he coined this name, dark matter, that we know today, in studies of stellar motion in our galaxy. Back then, he found that no dark matter was needed in the solar neighborhood. Of course, the measurement, the precisions were not as good as today. And then later on, Jan Oort suggested that there would be more dark than visible matter in the vicinity of the sun, which, however, turned out to be wrong. And finally, you know, fast forward 33, Fritz Zwicky found this dark matter, Dunkle Materie. He was a Swiss astronomer working, however, at Caltech in the coma cluster where he studied the redshift of galaxies and those were much larger than the escape velocities that would be due to the luminous matter alone. And um, well, this was a very, um, he was in many ways ahead of his time. You know, he was quite famous, he's quite famous now. And it seems also he had a difficult character, but in any case, this result went quite unnoticed for a long time, maybe until the 70s when Rubin, Ford, and others studied, in fact, the rotation curves of galaxies, they saw this, um, well, flat optical rotation curves. Later on, these were studied also in the radio that allows you to go to much higher radii. Um, so this, this issue then got renewed attention. Let's see, until now, really fast forward to today, when we have many, many observations, astrophysical observation, cosmological observations on, uh, impressive, on an impressive range of scales, you know, from galaxies to clusters of galaxies to large-scale structures and finally also to the very early times in our universe. And you know this very well here where we study the cosmic microwave background. And all of this seems to give, um, well, a so-called consistent picture of our universe where about 68% of the matter and energy content is made of dark energy and about 32% of matter. Coincidentally, this happens to be, this is the ratio of water and, you know, soil on Earth. It has, of course, nothing to do with this. I just found this picture. Um, but obviously, and out of matter, out of the matter, about 85% is dark matter, while the rest is luminous matter and even a fewer percent in stars. So even though we do have this nice picture of the universe, the question is what, is what is, well, dark energy and dark matter. But today, I will deal with a dark matter puzzle. And in my view, it is fundamental because we know that this dark matter leads to the formation of structures in our universe. And we can study these structures on the larger scales, uh, you know, through the influence of this dark matter, uh, so the gravitational influence of the dark matter on the luminous matter, okay? And even though we have now what we call a standard model of, of cosmology of cold dark matter, the lambda CDM model, uh, you know, precision doesn't mean also understanding because, as I mentioned, uh, you know, 85% of the matter in the universe is, is unknown. We have no clue what is dark matter is made of. So let's see first what do we actually know about it. Uh, and uh, I mentioned already we can study it's, uh, we can prove it through gravity, but what else? So we have a lot of constraints from astrophysics on the one hand, and on the other hand from searches, from various searches that I will mention. Uh, so it does not have any color charge. It doesn't have any electric charge. And it might have some self-interaction that we don't really know, but it doesn't seem to be very strong. And those constraints are actually also coming from astrophysics, from something like the bullet clusters, for instance. And in order to be the dark matter in our universe, it has to be either stable or if it, if it decays, then it has to be very long-lived, obviously. Now, um, so I said we don't know what the dark matter is made of, but we do have a lot of uh, ideas, or should I say the theorists have a lot of ideas. So this parameter space here that is just a cross-section of the dark matter particle, we are assuming now that it's made out of a new particle, with normal matter normalized here to low energy, to low energy neutrino cross-sections as a function of the mass. 
Okay, this spans about 80 orders or so in magnitude. Uh, and most searches actually are optimized, as I will show you, to search here for this region for WIMPs for weakly interacting massive particle, looks like a small region in this immense parameter space, but actually it is not so small, as I will show you in more detail later on. And uh, even though I will not really talk about this today, I also would like to mention that this parameter uh, space here is also being searched for with the so-called axion searches. Okay, so we have the axion dark matter experiment that is looking and will actually cover here a relevant part of the parameter space for the standard QCD axion. And then we have other type of searches that look for so-called axion-like particles, such as these light shining through wall experiments or um, so-called helioscopes, so um, like the cast helioscope at CERN, looking for axions coming from the sun. Uh, and another remark, the experiments that I will um, talk about here today are in fact also starting to set at least constraints on, on axion-like particles, but also on solar axions. However, maybe you can ask me later, you know, at 3.30, because I won't have time to really go into this here. So now let us assume that we are under the so-called WIMP lamppost, and we are assuming that our dark matter candidate is a so-called weakly interacting massive particle that is just a very generic name for, uh, you know, for classes of dark matter candidates from theories that go beyond the standard model of particle physics, such as supersymmetry or universal extra dimensions and so on. So we assume that uh, because this particle annihilated in the early universe, it has some kind of interaction apart from gravitational interaction with, uh, with baryons, with normal matter, so with, with some sort of mediator, we will come back to this later on. And then you can, you can try to produce this particle at colliders. So you collide whatever protons with protons and you produce some dark matter states that of course will not interact in your detector. Um, so you have to use, um, you know, you have to use a missing energy momentum in order to look for it. On the other hand, you can, uh, you can still have annihilation of these dark matter particles in regions uh, in our universe, for instance, in the galactic centers or around it or in the sun or wherever, producing all sorts of standard model particles that then decay, producing, for instance, high energy gammas or neutrinos or positrons or antiprotons. And this is the signatures that the so-called indirect detection experiments are looking for, basically for these standard model particles above some astrophysical background. And this is quite model independent in some way because it depends on the annihilation channel and then it also depends, well, then you have to know very well uh, the astrophysics backgrounds. So you have to model the propagation of these particles in the galaxy and so on, especially for the charged ones. Well, and then finally, you can have um, the direct detection, and I will talk more about this uh, here. This direct detection method actually looks for collision of these invisible particles with atomic nuclei, okay? So the idea is very simple. You have a WIMP and uh, an incoming WIMP that then just scatters in a certain material, mostly elastically, off an entire nucleus and then leaves again, leaves the detector unobserved. However, what you observe, what you can observe, is a small nuclear recoil energy that is transferred onto this, uh, onto this atomic nucleus, okay? And because, as we shall see, we know from astrophysics, this has been actually proposed here already in the mid 80s, and uh, obviously I will show you there's been a lot of progress since then, but because these particles move very slowly in the Milky Way, so with about 220 kilometers per second, that's just our velocity around the galactic center, um, they have low momenta, you know, uh, maybe tens, maybe a hundred MeV or so. So the scattering will happen in the deep non-relativistic regime and you will have a nuclear recoil energy that's from a few kV, as we shall see, depends on the mass of the WIMPs, on where it's in the velocity distribution, to maybe up to 30 or, or 50 kV or so, okay? So very low energy transfer. Now, if you want to build a detector to look for this type of particles that supposedly make up the halo, the dark matter halo of our galaxy, 
then you need to estimate what, uh, what you expect in such a detector. Okay? And here on the left side is what we try to measure. It's a differential nuclear recoil rate as a function of this recoil energy. And um, as I will show you, it, is, it looks pretty boring because it's quite featureless. There's no real peak or something that uh, is like a you know, dark matter signature. But this then will depend on the number of um, quantities here from, for instance, from detector physics, obviously on the number of nuclei that you have available for the scattering in your detector. It will depend here on the number density that's given by the local, local dark matter density, so the dark matter density in the vicinity of the you know, Earth or Sun, divided by the mass of the WIMP. Then we have here the scattering cross-section, and here is the integral from some minimum velocity that will depend actually on the energy threshold of your detector, so the minimum velocity that you can probe of this WIMP up to some maximum velocity that's related to the escape velocity of WIMPs from our galaxy. And here, the velocity distribution. So we have, from particle physics, ideally, we'd like to know the mass of the WIMP and the scattering cross-section, so we have only predictions, as I will show you. And then from astrophysics, we'd like to know the local density and the velocity distribution. And the velocity distribution, we cannot yet measure it actually directly, but we know it roughly from and body simulations of galaxy formation, okay? So it is mostly Maxwellian. However, there seem to be some departures, at least seen in, in you know, older simulations, dark matter only, dark matter only simulations. These days, uh, the simulations have quite evolved and also include baryonic matter. Um, but these deviations are actually quite small and so far are not really significant for, for direct detection uh, experiments. So we will just briefly now go through this. Uh, so from astrophysics, there are different ways to measure the local density here at a distance of 8 kiloparsec from the galactic center. So on the one hand, we have the so-called local measures that use the kin vertical kinematics of stars near the, near the sun, so groups of stars, as, as tracers of the overall potential. Um, well, there are some strong assumptions there about the shape of the halo and so on. And, uh, well, I think now with the first Gaia data, there will be quite some progress in the next few years to get a better handle on this, on this um, local density from, from, uh, you know, from the measurement of the position and velocity of millions and millions of stars. Okay. Then we have also global measures where what is measured is the rotation curve of the Milky Way. Um, and and uh, of course we have to model, you have to model everything, the dark component, but especially the baryonic component, and that is, uh, that is not trivial. And this is why for this local density, the errors are still quite large, so about a factor of two. It is somewhere, even though there are quite a lot of papers and a lot of groups pretending they can give a much more precise value, this is, by the way, a review here by Justin Reed from last year, so it's a very nice survey of this field. So you have about 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 or so GV per cubic centimeters. Or if you're an astrophysicist, you probably prefer solar massive per, uh, masses per cubic parsec. So now the question is, what does this tell us? What does this number tell us as a particle physicist? Well, so if you now assume some central value here that we all take a sort of canonical value to compare the results of various experiments and give actually uh, some number on the cross-section because what we measure is a rate, as I already mentioned here. We don't actually measure the cross-section, but we measure a rate. And if you make some assumption about the, the local uh, density, then we can give some constraints later on on the cross-section. Okay? So if you take now the central value and the wind mass of 100 GeV, then I calculated this, you get about 10 to the 5, 100,000 WIMPs per every square centimeters and per second flying through you. Okay? So now, does this seem like a big number or a small number? Big, small? Can you with yeah, maybe you can compare with neutrinos. So what is the flux of PP neutrinos? No <laughs> okay. So does anyone know the flux? This is the, these are the PP neutrinos in the first reaction in the sun. I think Concha, no? 
Yeah, so it's 65 billions per square centimeters and second, okay? And as you know, those neutrinos are really hard to measure. Uh, but, and this is a much smaller flux, but it's not zero, hopefully. <laughs> and if the, and now depending, of course, on the cross-section, there is also a non-zero probability that we might observe these particles in the laboratory. Okay, okay so from particle physics, um, so for direct detection, in general, we use so-called effective operators to describe the WIMP quark interactions. For instance, you can have a vector mediator or axial vector mediator and so on. And this is here, this is just an effective Lagrangian where, you know, just like in Fermi theory, you have this effector operator that arises from integrating out this mediator that you don't really know, but that you can assume that has a certain mass and a certain coupling on the one hand to the quarks and on the other hand to the WIMP, okay? And this will be this contact interaction scale, okay, just like the Fermi scale in uh, weak interactions, where here, again, you have the mass of the mediator and these are the couplings, and then the total cross-section will actually scale as one over this scale to the fourth power, okay? So you can see that a cross-section, you don't expect it to be large, if this is somewhere around a TV or so, okay? Now, uh, just an example actually. So of course, when uh, very early in this field, the, the simplest idea would have been that such a particle just uh, interacts via Z boson exchange, but then you can immediately calculate the cross-section and it turns around, turns around to be 10 to the minus 39 or so square centimeters. And this is something that uh, direct detection experiments have excluded since many years, okay? Now, on the other hand, when you have something like Higgs exchange, and maybe you know there are all these so-called Higgs portal dark matter models now, but uh, there roughly the cross-sections that you predict, or that the theorists predict, are in this range 10 to the minus 44 or 10 to the minus 47 uh, square centimeters. And this is actually good news because this is the range that can be covered by experiments that are either already operating or will soon operate. Um, you know. Okay, so now if we integrate over all that we know, then what do we get for the total rate? It's about 0 0.1 events per kilogram of your detector material and per year. So again, it's a very small number, modulo all of these, you know, mass number of 100, this cross-section, which is obviously smaller than the mean velocity of the WIMP and here the, the local density. And what I'm showing here is now this differential rate as a function of the recall energy. So this is a logarithmic scale for several materials that are used in this field. So the detectors that are made, for instance, of xenon, germanium, argon, silicon, and so on. So you have some enhancement here because of the heavy nucleus on the one hand. On the other hand, as I'll show you, you also will have to deal with form factor corrections because the WIM doesn't scatter on quarks, but it actually scatters on the entire nucleus. However, for WIMPs in the high velocity tail of the distribution and also for larger nuclei, you can start to resolve individual nucleons, okay? So these um, form factors will actually play a role. And luckily, uh, oh, I actually I meant to say something, maybe. I'm not sure if it comes, but I, I just like to say that there are quite a lot of uh, nuclear theory groups now that uh, look again at these form factors and actually calculated them both for spin dependent and also for spin independent scattering for actually all the nuclei that are relevant in direct detection. Okay, so now there's quite a um, zoo of experiments because as you can imagine, it's, um, you know, it's a, very, a very hot field, so we have this recall energy somewhere that is very small that we are trying to detect. And then we use experiments that are based on phonon readouts or lattice vibrations or charge readout. These are ionization based experiments or light, namely scintillation experiments. And many of the modern, uh, modern detectors try to detect, for instance, both phonon and charge or charge and light or phonons and light. And why? Because uh, the ratio of these two quantities, for instance, will depend on the ionization density on dE over dx, and that again will depend on the type of particle interaction in your detector. So that will allow you 
to reject a large part of the background that is mostly of electromagnetic origin, so gammas, betas, and so on. Obviously, I cannot go through all of these detectors, uh, but I should mention that apart from this, uh, what I've shown you, that is rate and also the shape of the recoil spectrum depends on the one hand on the detector material, on the other hand also on the WIMP mass. I haven't actually shown that, we'll come to that later. We also have some specific signatures for a dark matter particle that is in the halo of our galaxy, and that is on the one hand an annual event rate modulation, so you can imagine this. So you have an asymmetry in the rate between summer and winter, okay? And this comes from the fact that on the one hand, we are moving together with the sun towards here constellation signal, so we are moving around the galactic center, but also the Earth is actually moving around the sun, as we know, and in June, the two velocities are mostly aligned, so parallel, while in December, they are anti-parallel. However, it's a very small effect, because here, the Earth moves with around, only with around 30 kilometers per second, and then also this plane is inclined, so it's about, you, you can take about 15 divided by 220 or so. So it's only a very small effect, but that is potentially observable, and actually there is one experiment that claims that they have seen this effect, okay? On the other hand, um, because the Earth rotates on its axis, and again, we move here together with the Earth, we feel this wimp wimp, I guess you feel it too, then, at least I feel it all the time. <laughs> then, uh, you know, we can also look at asymmetry in the forward-backward uh, direction of this incoming wimp, right? And this is a much larger effect on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's a very hard effect to measure because you have a very low energy nuclear recoil and the track will be uh, in, a, in a solid or in a liquid, the track will not be measurable. So you have to have a low pressure gas in order to be able to measure that. That is conflicting with the fact that you need a lot of nuclei, a lot of mass to get your event rate, you know, to some reasonable number, like one a year at least. So, uh, but anyway, these signatures are there and we might look for them. But then we have a lot of background. So in astrophysics, of course, you also have a lot of foregrounds, backgrounds, and, and also in particle physics experiments, and we also have to deal with them. So first of all, we have cosmic rays and cosmic activate, well, activation of the detector materials by cosmic rays. And to deal with cosmic rays, we go deep underground, as you will see. Uh, then we have radioactivity. We have the natural radioactivity that's just everywhere. So uranium, thorium, potassium, and then man-made radioactivity that is also lots of it <laughs> up there. As, well, up there in terms of krypton in the air. That's a big problem, for instance, for xenon-based experiments uh, that comes from Fukushima, from nuclear bomb tests and so on, but also cesium. And these give you gammas, betas, neutrons, alphas, everything. And uh, the most dangerous for dark matter, at least for WIMP dark matter searches, are neutrons because fast neutrons will also give you, um, you know, nuclear recoils in the same energy range where you are looking for, for a WIMP. However, ultimately, and when I started in this field, which as you can imagine was a very long time ago, I didn't think that neutrinos will be our, our ultimate background. So we have to deal, first of all, I'm not showing it here, we will have to deal with neutrino electron scatters from the PP neutrinos. I told you already that the flux is very high, and uh, even though most ex experiments can discriminate between interactions from electrons and or electronic recoils in your detector on nuclear recoils, the discrimination is not perfect. There's nothing 100% in physics, so you have a certain efficiency and you can, you can um, misidentify, for instance, a neutrino electron scatter for a nuclear recoil. But ultimately, ultimately, this is again the neutrinos that are measured from the PP neutrinos to 8 beryllium, atmospheric and so on. Ultimately, we will have coherent neutrino nucleus scattering that is, uh, you know, it's a standard model process even though it wasn't observed yet uh, in an experiment. And if you look here, so for instance, um, the solar bore 8 neutrino will just look like a 6 GV WIMP or so, and pretty soon, already at the cross sections of around 10 to the minus 45 or so square centimeters, while as you go to higher here in energy, you will have the, 
atmospheric neutrinos and also the neutrinos from the diffuse supernova uh, neutrino background. That could mimic, for instance, higher mass WIMPs. But as I will show you later on there, we have about, uh, from today, let's say about four orders of magnitude to go until we hit that background. Okay, so how do we deal with the backgrounds? I already told you that we have to go deep underground, and there are many underground laboratories in the world. I work here in Gran Sasso, which is um, in Italy, but there's also uh, an underground lab here in Spain, the Camp Frank Laboratory. We have to use active shields, even though we go underground, because the walls of the lab, the concrete, the rocks, and so they provide a lot of radioactivity. And most modern detectors use now large water Cherenkov shields, because the standard shield you cannot, you know, they become too heavy, too expensive to use lead and poly and, and copper and so on. And we also have to screen a lot, basically every single material that we are using in our detector. This was here my son many years ago, so I, he had to help because there's actually a lot of screening work to be done in any of these experiments. You can imagine, I will show you later the xenon one ton detector, but we had to screen every little screw that is in that experiment and even only the inner detector has more than 1,000 parts. So we have to select very low background materials. I'm showing you here just the germanium spectrum. We use germanium detectors because they, are, they have very low intrinsic background, but also they have a very high energy resolution that allows us to identify all these lines. These are 15 photo detectors in xenon one ton. So you see a lot of these lines there. So anyway, you have to deal with them. Now, also, how, how else do we deal with backgrounds? Well, we have what we call fiducialization, very similar to neutrino physics. A lot of our background events will be here at the, um, at the outer regions of the detector, so you can define an inner, uh, an inner region, an inner fiducial region that is hopefully close to background free. This is here just data from the Xenon 100 detector. We use discrimination. This is what I mentioned. In this case here, what we show is the ratio of uh, of a light, sorry, of charge to light in a detector. So you have a population that you define as background-like events, for instance, here electronic recoils, and here a signal-like, okay? And also, as I mentioned, you have to avoid to expose, in fact, your detector materials to cosmic rays, because palation reactions by high-energy protons, neutrons, will produce, among other things, also nuclei with very long half-lives. And here, for instance, just an example, we, um, we brought some xenon to the Jungfrau Joch, that's at 3.5 kilometers, and, um, but we also brought some copper. So you see here the copper before it was exposed to cosmic rays and then after it was exposed. So you produce a lot of stuff and uh, that's why you really have to minimize the exposure. Okay, okay so what is actually this so-called wind landscape today? So what I'm showing here is a cross-section that is, however, normalized to a nucleon. Again, that, so that we can compare different type of experiments using different type of nuclei. Uh, so normalized to a proton or to a neutron as a function of the mass of the WIMP. And this region here, all of this is excluded by the current uh, generation of experiments. This is, will be probed by detectors that have a very low energy threshold because for low mass WIMPs, the nuclear recoil energy will also be much smaller, so you need that in order to address this region, while here it's mostly larger detectors where, you know, the size but also the, the time, so the total exposure will be important, okay? And because you might ask me, you see I'm not showing here any predictions. What I'm showing here is the region where at some point your rate will be dominated by neutrinos, okay? But you may want to ask, well, what are actual predictions? And I'm showing here two from SUSY, just as an example, because there are zillions out there. And this is a very constrained model, the constrained MSSM. And you see here, uh, this was in 2014, after, well, after the last LHC data, for the LHC data from the last run, you have here this region and also this region. I should say that these regions, of course, with more data from direct detection experiments, but also from the LHC, over the years kept moving to the right and downwards, obviously. Uh, on the other hand, here from a paper dealing with a phenomenological MSSM, I think with 15 here or 19 free parameters, where of course a much larger space of the parameter space then opens up just because you have a lot of free parameters. So these are just some predictions, but uh, 
I guess the point that I want to make here is that, of course, there is a region of parameter space predicted where this next generation of detectors will look at, but on the other hand, uh, you know, it can also be much below. So even much below this uh, background here from neutrinos. So I mentioned that there is one experiment, that's the Dama Libra experiment in Gran Sasso that actually has seen annual modulation. Where it comes from, it's of course another story, but this is their data over many years now, I think eight or nine years. So the statistical significance that they see such modulation is very high. It also has a correct period and phase. Uh, however, if you interpret it as due to WIMP dark matter, it's in quite in conflict with a lot of other experiments. So these would be these Dama regions, and there are now many, they're not even all here. There are many other experiments that do not see a signal should the cross-section and mass be as predicted by this Dama, okay, on the one hand. On the other hand, um, there are still quite a few projects that are building detectors that are made of the same type of material. So really sodium iodide detectors, these are crystals that are seen by photomultipliers where you just measure the scintillation light. So there is a uh, SABER, there is here in Spain ANAIS, DMI, SKIMS, just an example SABER, they are planning to use this type of crystals in, in, um, in a liquid scintillator. This is a Princeton-based experiment and here they would like to tag, well, okay, so they, they have crystals that support, or they will have crystals that have a lower background than the DAMA ones and also by tagging uh, events that are in coincidence with um, an event in the scintillator around this crystal, they might get to this very low background. So this would be here the DAMA signal that there is this bump there at 3 kV that could be due to potassium, for instance. It's not clear, but in any case, they would like to probe that as also the other experiments. Now, there's also something else. So there are a lot of papers making the case, well, maybe uh, what DAMA sees is not nuclear recoils, but actually some electronic recoils, because they have no discrimination whatsoever in their detector. They have no position resolution, no discrimination. So they're really very simple type of detectors. Uh, and these are so-called leptophilic models, where you have some dark matter that has some interaction with electrons. And these were viable, but recently I will show you, have actually been excluded, but I will come to that. Now, I mentioned that this low-mass region uh, will be tested by so-called phonon-based detectors, and they operate at temperatures of about a few tens of millikelvin, and they would like to detect a temperature rise after a particle interacts in an absorber, typically a crystal, that is connected here to a bath. You have the thermal link, and uh, then the question is, of course, how do you measure very small temperature rises of the order of a few microkelvin or so, and there you use, for instance, transition edge sensors, just like in the CDMS or, or also CREST experiment. And here again, if you look at the so-called ionization yield, which is the ratio of charge to the phonon signal, you have here background-like events that are electronic recoils and a very nice separation with signal-like events that come from nuclear recoils. And you calibrate this with strong gamma sources here or with neutron sources. And this is done by all the experiments in the field. So in, we have the super CDMS experiment that has been approved to go to a larger phase at Snow Lab in, in the US and in Europe we have Edelweiss in France and, and Crest that is in Gran Sasso. Um, okay, so as I mentioned already, these are just some predictions. Uh, they are now around here and these are the predictions where, for instance, super CDMS might go in the future with these new runs at Snow Lab. Okay? And they will test, of course, also here part of this high mass region. I, I'm not showing the slide, but I would also like to mention that there's also a proposal, well, there are the plans that they might join forces and build a much larger detector at Snow Lab. So there's a European Eureka uh, project that is Edelweiss and Crest. So together with Super CDMS, they might go to a 100 kilogram or so detector. So noble gases, so we come to this part here of the periodic table <laughs> that, you, that we nicely have on the wall and we will mostly deal here with xenon and with argon, even though radon and krypton are real troublemakers because they give us a lot of background that we don't want in the end. So uh, why are these materials, maybe before I go there, I should have mentioned that actually today the best results, the best limits here come from xenon-based experiments, so experiments based on noble liquids, okay? 
And this is why noble liquids are now, in principle, very interesting for uh, dark matter detectors. So they have a very high light yield, and they also have a high charge yield. Okay? You see here the light, xenon, argon, it's in the VUV, unfortunately. That's quite difficult to measure. Uh, and xenon also means the strange one, while argon is the inactive one. So these two are used in uh, dark matter detectors. And what we detect is, on the one hand, the scintillation light after particle scatters in a liquid, well, in a no liquid detector. But on the other hand, as I will show you also, the few free electrons that are produced in a collision. And there are two philosophies here. On the one hand, the so-called single phase detector. Single phase means you just have a large amount of liquid, let's say liquid xenon or argon, that you instrument all around it with photo detectors, photosensors. And then you look at this uh, very well, prompt, fast scintillation light that is being produced when a particle scatters here in your fiducial volume. Okay? And the two examples that are here are the XMAS detector, a xenon-based detector in uh, Japan, in the Kamioka um, mine. They have about 800 kilograms of uh, liquid xenon in total. They have to fiducialize, and they will use just the innermost 100 kilogram detectors. They had some issues with backgrounds, and they have totally refurbished their detector, and they are running again. The problem with background is here, for instance, they had some backgrounds in their PMTs. But uh, because in the single phase detectors, their position resolution is actually not very good, uh, then you can reconstruct events that are here at the edges as events in the center of your detector. Okay? And this is not really what you want. And then for argon, there's the DEEP uh, 3600 experiment. It's no lab, so we are all looking at DEEP because they are in commissioning. And first result, so it's the largest uh, argon detector now that's available. First results hopefully will be, well, I guess late 2015, that's not really true. By now it will be 2016 or so. And then the so-called so uh, dual phase noble leaky detectors, where you actually build a TPC, a time projection chamber. And what happens here is, again, you have a large amount of liquid, but on top you have the vapor phase that is in equilibrium with the liquid. So you have, on the one hand, the prompt scintillation light signal that is observed by uh, mostly the ray that's immersed in the liquid, but also by a top array. And then you have a few electrons that are liberated in the process, and you apply a strong drift field, typically about one kilovolt per centimeter, then a much higher extraction field, typically 10 kilovolts per centimeter or so, to extract them in the gas phase, where they again will collide with atoms and produce what we call proportional scintillation signal. So a larger scintillation light signal that is proportional to the actual energy deposited in the detector. Okay? And the ratio of the two will tell you whether you deal mostly with a signal-like or a background-like event. But most importantly, the time difference gives you quite precisely, with sub-millimeter precision, the z position of your interaction. And the um, distribution of the light in the top photosensor array, because this light here, the S2 light, as we call it, is very localized, will give you the xy position. So you have a very good 3D position reconstruction of where the event happens, and that helps you to reject a lot of the background. Also, a lot of neutrons, because neutrons, as we know, are strongly interacting particles, and they tend to multiple scatter. Okay? So we have the Xenon 100 detector still operating in Gran Sasso, mostly now doing calibration measurements for one ton. The LUX experiment uh, in the US that has now the best limit for, uh, for WIMPs, as I've shown you, and also in Gran Sasso, a liquid argon-based experiment, namely the dark side detector. Right? And I, I, I won't go in the details of these detectors. Maybe I'll just show you very, uh, some very well recent results. So dark side 50, they just, uh, I think in October, they published a limit. They're not really competitive with Lux or Xenon 100, so they're here. On the one hand, also it's a much smaller detector. But on the other hand, what I've shown is that they could reach a depletion of about a factor of 1,000 in this argon-39. So in argon, you have a problem of the cosmogenically produced argon-39 that comes from the atmosphere. And that gives you um, a lot of beta decays in your detector. So you need, you need argon 
Here they take it from underground sources that is depleted to 1,000, but maybe even more. Okay. Okay. There's also another detector, but it's in in the um, in China. It's called Panda X. It's also a dual phase liquid xenon detector. Now there was a new result, recent new result from uh, xenon 100. I mentioned it here because we actually looked at so-called these leptophilic models, where we just assume that you have a dark matter particle that interacts with electrons and you try to see whether you actually could see the signal by DAMA, because xenon 100 also has a very low energy threshold. But most importantly, it has a background that is more than 100 times lower than the background in DAMA, without any discrimination. Okay? So this is the xenon 100 background, this is DAMA's background, and that may be a signal. Uh, so this is just to explain you very briefly the principle of this, and this is now the integrated background here over a certain amount of time, and this is what you would expect from DAMA in these various leptophilic models, and obviously we do not see that. Okay? And this is, why, this is why this DAMA region in these models can be excluded. Again, I'm not going to go in the details, there's another paper where we looked at the annual variation of the event rate, and again, there's no there's no measured annual variation, and that also excludes DAMA, that's a PRL that also appeared. But okay, so what is now the future for these uh, noble leaky detectors? Well, under construction, I should say under commissioning now, is xenon one ton, and the next phase will be n ton in Gran Sasso. There's also a proposed and approved project in the US, that's the biggest competitor, of course, the LZ, the Lux Zeppelin experiment, that will also use seven tons of liquid xenon, and also there's a proposal for five ton experiment in Japan. For argon, there's a proposal of a 20 ton detector in Gran Sasso, and a 50 ton deep detector at Snow Lab. And finally, there are also some R&D and design studies. Uh, we are involved in this Darwin design study that would operate a 30 to 50 ton uh, liquid xenon detector for dark matter, but also for other type of physics. So I'm showing you now some, uh, some slides on xenon one ton because we just finished installing it uh, in Gran Sasso. We are now commissioning the detector. We started in autumn of 2013. And you can see here, this is from outside the water shield. Inside, now this is a picture because you can't really see inside, but I will show you. <laughs> you know, this is just a large water tank, but inside is a Cherenkov shield, and then there's a structure that holds the cryostat, and then inside the cryostat is now the TPC. But this is the service building, and uh, I hope you appreciate it. Actually, we just had the inauguration mid-November, and a lot of people really liked it that it's not closed, so you can actually see everything. So we have here the xenon storage system that is called Restox that can store 7.6 tons of xenon in liquid or even gas phase. Then some cryogenics here, the DAC electronics room here, and here the cryogenic room. Sorry, here was the, is the purification because you constantly have to purify the xenon for uh, electronegative impurities, and also you have to purify it before you start for krypton. So we have a very long, five meters long krypton distillation column uh, just to take out the krypton from the xenon, that's already very low, okay? So anyway, um, the background goal is another factor of 100 lower than in xenon 100. We already went a factor 100 lower than the first phase, that was xenon 10. And um, in terms of physics, I will show you 10 to the minus 47 or so cross section. So here you can see some pictures from inside. This is a cryostat. This is quite important. It's a very long pipe. We call it the umbilical pipe that connects the inner part of the detector with that building that has all the cryogenic pipes in it, but also the pipes for the signal, uh, for the cables. Here we were preparing actually the cables in Zurich. This is one of my postdocs. All the signal cables, the high voltage cables, and so on. They must be obviously installed in here. The, well, it's 10 meters, the whole, uh, the whole water tank, and this is uh, you know, there is some space from the, to the top, but not much. Yeah, this is the storage system. Uh, here you can see it. So this here is 10 meters tall. Hmm? Where is this where so this is in hall B. It is next to where Icarus was. So Icarus is on the, was on the right of it. Now there's nothing there. And on the left of it, we have a failed, but maybe I'm not saying anything because, okay, <laughs> I, okay. Anyway, so this is the inner detector where was mostly our responsibility in Zurich, the actual time projection chamber. We have two, uh, you can see here the field cage, 
uh, we have 74 field shaping rings because you have to have a very uniform drift field for your electrons. You don't want to have any dependence of your signal on the position. Then we have the structure is mostly made out of Teflon, the inner structure, the reflector, because it has a very high reflectivity for the xenon UV light on the one hand. On the other hand, it's radio pure. You can see here we also developed the, the readout for the, so we were also responsible for uh, half of the photosensors. So we have the three inch photodetectors with very low radioactivity. This is here their basis, their electronics readout. Uh, well, this is when we were assembling and then doing some mechanical cryogenic tests of the TPC in Zurich. You can see here some of my postdocs and students. And here we were assembling the PMT arrays at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. After we assembled everything, we disassembled it, we cleaned, and we brought to Gran Sasso, where we assembled all of this in the clean room above ground. And then finally, the day came when, uh, you know, these were many, many weeks of work, as you can imagine, uh, being in the clean room every day until 10 p.m. or so. You can see here the nice photo sensor arrays, the bottom array, the top array. And then finally, the day came when we packed everything, we put it on a truck, and we moved underground. And then we brought it inside of the water tank. Of course, the cryostat had to be open. And then we lifted the TPC. And now it is so that the cryostat will be actually closed within this week. Then we first have to do a radar emanation test, and then first xenon in the detector, in, uh, hopefully in early January. So this was the xenon program. Uh, everything is built such that uh, we will have a very fast, hopefully, upgrade to a seven ton detector. Okay. Yeah, we didn't even start the first the one ton, so we are talking about, we have to talk about the upgrade already. So basically, the outer cryostat is large enough. Everything is large enough. But obviously, we have to build a new inner cryostat and a new TPC. And that is not, is by no means trivial. And we have to get another three tons or more of, of xenon. And finally, we also talk about Darwin. So here, we would go to a you know, 50 ton detector. Why? Well, because if you see some first signals in one ton or n ton or in LZ, you'd like to actually measure this signal with much higher statistics. You'd like to do some um, WIMP physics in the sense that you need a certain number of events if you want to determine what is the mass of the WIMP and its cross section. And it will be, you know, you will have quite some uncertainties. This is a study, there are many studies, but this is uh, the uncertainties here, they actually come from the uncertainties on the astrophysical parameters, on the density here, on the velocity, and also on the escape velocity. However, with such a large liquid xenon detector that has an incredibly low background, you can also look at other physics channels like PP neutrinos, double beta decay in 136 xenon, and so on. So where do we want to go in this, in this uh, parameter space? So again, we are here now with LUX. This is the prediction for deep 3600 that I just mentioned. Um, the prediction for xenon one ton and then n ton and LZ. And then finally, this would be for Darwin. We have done quite some detailed study here for an exposure of 200 ton years. I should say that this region here where neutrinos start to dominate um, is actually quite, uh, you know, the assumptions are that you have a three sigma detection line here at 500 events above 4 kV. Okay, so these are it's a very, very high exposure to reach this. So you can see even with 200 ton years, we barely get here, okay? So this is when I said we have here four orders of magnitude to go to actually reach that region on the one hand. On the other hand, here for the Bohr 8 coherent scattering, uh, we will already start to see some events in a xenon one ton upgrade, okay? So with xenon n ton. And we are looking, of course, at the detailed predictions there. It depends a lot on your low energy threshold, on the light and charge yield that is low energies, and so on. So there's quite some uncertainties there, but you will start to cut into this region. Maybe just one, uh, one uh, comparison, because you might ask, you know, how do we compare with accelerator searches? Again, there's a lot of literature here, and, uh, and uh, you know, some people go to these so-called minimal simplified dark matter models where you only have four variables, basically the mass of the WIMP, 
the mass of the mediator, and then these couplings, and then the cross sections I mentioned will scale like this here. For instance, you could have a Dirac fermion that interacts with vector or via axial vector a mediator. And uh, this is a study done in this paper. So basically, this is LHC 14 predictions here for the spin independent channel for various couplings, because these couplings are, of course, not known okay, as a function of the mass. And this is then compared here with LZ and Darwin. So obviously, LHC has here much better sensitivity at uh, low wind masses, because they are not limited in energy to create this. For the spin dependent channel here, sorry, that should, should be the other way around, yeah. So this is a spin dependent, where actually they are quite competitive, but here spin independent, we can see that, um, you know, LHC is here not really competitive, but still they can probe here this low mass region that is very hard to, um, this is very hard to measure with direct detection experiments. So, and so on my last slide, this is just a historical plot. Uh, I mentioned that I started to work on this field very long time ago. So back then, we actually were working on double beta decay with germanium ionization detectors. And because the requirements are very similar, namely extremely low background from radioactivity, cosmic rays, and so on, we also started to look at dark matter interactions and set here some first limits. But then really the field took off once uh, these um, cryogenic experiments came on board, the millikelvin detectors such as CDMS, and then later the um, detectors that are based on noble liquids, noted, most notably here liquid xenon detectors, you know, such as we were here with xenon 10, then 100, lux, and so on. And these are just, of course, now predictions where we would like to go in terms of the cross section as a function of the year here. So when I actually looked at this plot, I couldn't believe it. But here, there was about a factor of 10 increase in sensitivity every two years. That was quite amazing. So it beats Moore's law uh, on the one hand. On the other hand is, you know, can we keep this rate that we have to demonstrate now? We don't know. OK. So what I've shown you is hopefully that direct detection experiments have reached tremendous sensitivities. We can probe now pretty low cross sections. Uh, down to 10 to the minus 45, or even lower now for mean masses around 50 GeVs. We can also probe other particle, uh, well, particle masses below 10 GeV, and in fact, new models. There are also quite a lot of, there's a lot of literature on this. Uh, we are quite complementary with the LHC, but also with indirect searches that I haven't really shown here. With indirect searches, it's easiest to compare with searches for a neutrino annihilation in the sun. Um, well, I could say that the prospects for discovery are quite good. We have increased this sensitivity in WIMPs by about two orders of magnitudes, and we have to increase it in the next few years. And hopefully, we can reach really this neutrino background. Why? Well, because this also provides kind of a natural limit when you say, OK, now you stop. You, you, know, you switch fields. You look for something else, because it doesn't really make sense to go, to go much, uh, much further unless you want to become a neutrino physicist, which of course is also an option. So I will leave you here with this comment, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk. We have a few minutes for questions, if anyone, does anyone have any questions? That's a very good point, and actually I have a slide on that, because that has been studied uh, namely, directional information that you could use because you know, at least for the solar neutrinos, you know the direction, right? That's what you're saying. And you can improve. You can go below it. So this is a study that was shown that, you know, assumes um, gas that is used in uh, directional detectors. As I mentioned, they have to be low pressure gas. And this assumes xenon, even though we, in xenon we have no direction. But if you would have the direction, that in xenon, you see, you can improve here, obviously, uh, these low mass WIMPs because you have the eight bore neutrino background. But, you know, at higher masses, there's not much that you can do because the, atmo the atmospheric neutrinos, they just come from everywhere, right? And similarly, actually here, you know, you can, you can get some improvement indeed when you measure the direction. But, you know, it will be, again, depending what the cross section is because uh, the current cross section limits, if you want to build a directional detector, it has to be the size of MINOS. Maybe some of you are familiar with the large neutrino detector 
uh, you know, it has to be quite large. But we don't know if that cross-section is 10 to the minus 45. It's probably not, right? So if you go to 10 to the minus 49, well, then building a detector that has directional sensitivity, it will be gigantic. You know, you may want to do it, but I think you will only do it, actually, in case you have a discovery. Because if you have a discovery with any of these detectors, then you say, OK, I know more or less what the mass is, what is the cross-section. I know what type of directional detectors I want to build to confirm that. But if you have nothing, then going and building, I don't think you will get uh, the money for that. You know? Or that anybody will probably do it. But yeah. A quick, slightly naive question. Is, there, is it possible to use the spin dependence that we, if we do see a spin dependence? Does that tell us something about the spin of the particle, or is that uh, something separate? Well, um, that's, that's also a good question. It will be, so to look for spin dependency, you have to have, uh, of course, a nucleus that has uh, non-zero spin, right? total angular momentum. Like in xenon, it's 129, 171. But also your dark matter particle has to have a spin. Yeah? Right. Uh, but then from a direct detection experiment to actually determine the spin of that particle, that will be very difficult. Actually, even determining that what you see is due to spin interaction, spin, spin, it will be very hard. You know, there are ways to do it uh, by comparing different materials, by looking for spin-dependent inelastic scattering and so on, because inelastic scattering, uh, the um, cross-section for spin-independent is much, much lower, so it's totally suppressed. And, but I think there you really need a collider experiment to determine the spin. Yeah. Thank our speaker again.